Hello, everybody. I want to graciously welcome you all to this Zoom webinar hosted by University of Detroit Mercy, the Kearney Latin American Solidarity Archive, or CLASA. We're glad that you could join us for this evening's event. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Humphrey Ojuang. He will share with us his work on the pedagogical value of indigenous knowledge for food security, learning from women sages in East Africa. He's a senior research fellow and the thematic unit head of language, culture, and society in linguistic anthropology in the Institute of Anthropology, Gender, and African Studies at University of Nairobi. His institute and his office are located in the famous Kenya National Museum. He has received his BA in Linguistic Education in English Language and Literature with honors. He received his master's of Science in Applied Linguistic in English Language from University of Aston in Birmingham, England. He has been a British Council Scholar and a Dodd Regional Guest Professor at the Department of African Languages, University of Pretoria. He received his PhD from University of Nairobi from the Institute of Anthropology, Gender and African Studies. He did his dissertation research work under the directorship of his mentor, Professor Wanjiku Kabiru. He categorizes his work as work in African narrative epistemology and pedagogy and African feminist epistemology and pedagogy. As he explained when he introduced his topic to us, he considers himself a male feminist along with his friend and colleague, Austin Bukenya, who is a columnist and a literature teacher. He, his research included life story interviewing. He was influenced by Akopi Batek, a Ugandan professor and writer who spent many years in Kenya, in Kisumu in Nairobi. His famous work was Song of Luino. Dr. Ojuang says that Pibitek was a feminist because he took the side of Luino over her husband, Ocho. Luino was portrayed as the custodian of culture. Other influences on his methodology include Professor H. Odera Oruka, who started a sage philosophy project in the 1970s. And also Michael Kirwan, a Merino father who is founder of the Merino Institute for African Studies at Tangaza College in Nairobi. Kirwan combines theology and anthropology in his studies and is a fluent Luo speaker. From these scholars, Professor Ojong learned the narrative approach to philosophy. As he went on to explain his methodology, he said he engages in discourse analysis, lexicography, and terminography. He explains there are two aspects to language. There's language acquisition, which is natural and spontaneous and happens during socialization. And then there is language learning in the context of schooling. In Kenya, there is competency-based learning. Women are submerged in environmental activities. He wants to explore the philosophy founded on their indigenous knowledge. He worries that indigenous knowledge has been pushed to the sidelines. 
we disregard the time-tested knowledge of women. Women know about food security, safety, sustainability, and sovereignty. Women's voices have been muted, but the 2010 Kenyan Constitution says that food is a human right. I want to mention that present with me for the interview with Dr. Ojwang is Dr. John Ouko, one of our philosophy teachers here. He received his master's degree in philosophy from University of Nairobi and his PhD from Michigan State University. He additionally teaches for us in addition to his position of lecturer in philosophy at Eastern Michigan University. Uh, John Ouko has also written on Professor Odera Aruka's Sage Philosophy Project and has translated and transcribed interviews of the Kenyan sages. Before turning to our speaker, I wanted to be sure to thank our co-sponsor, the Women's and Gender Studies Program here at University of Detroit Mercy. And I also want to thank my own department, the Department of Philosophy, for help with promoting this event. Thank you very much to my co-sponsors. And now I want to explain to all of you a challenge we have had with reaching out uh, to Dr. Ojwang for this interview. We had the challenge of time zones, not only time zones, but also during a time of coronavirus when Nairobi was experiencing a lockdown. Under these conditions, it was very important that Dr. Ojuang was able to use the good internet connection at the university. But with the time zones being as they are, with uh, 9 a.m. being 2 a.m. Nairobi time and 4 p.m. our time being 9 a.m. Detroit time and thinking it would be very difficult to get students to uh, show up in the middle of the night. What we did is uh, Dr. Uko and I interviewed Dr. Ojuang and we are going to uh, give you now the heart of his talk. When we're dealing with uh, food, I see women, and I think that women's knowledge should be mainstreamed. And I talked to quite a range of women between the age of 24, around 24, all the way to 96. I engage the women, 32. I interviewed 32 people. Uh, I was doing, I did, I took an ethnographic approach, narrative ethnography, but I also talked to a few men who are in positions of power and influence because I needed their policy framework and I made recommendations on how women's indigenous knowledge for food security should be mainstreamed in what we call uh, agricultural education and extension services. About our traditional crops. Now there's, 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 something, uh, there's something which is very critical. The word seed, seed. So indigenous seeds. So some of the women I, I interviewed were actually custodians of indigenous seeds. And they told me that they have kept those seeds from generation to generation. So they call them seed banks. So the seeds are never eaten. They are kept either smoked somewhere, kept somewhere far from evils, protected. They know how, they have the knowledge, the ethnoscientific knowledge for keeping them from weevils, especially the cereal crops, millet, sorghum, and also the cow peas. Those are ritual seeds. I call them ritual seeds. 
they have ritual significance. So this work, there's a lot I left out of this work. Because you are limited ones, but there's a lot of extra knowledge which we can explore with Detroit, as we still have our sister, Professor Gail Presby, based there, and my brother, Professor John Uko. I'm glad that you are roped in by Professor Presby. And I don't mind your students. You know, you told me there are how many are they? The students in the class? You are, yes, you're philosophy oh. students, yes. Because, I mean, we have 5,000 students in the university, and everybody takes uh, philosophy introduction to philosophy once, and uh, John has a particular class that will see this, but we will open it up to the whole university so anyone can see it. Wow. And... I want to let you know that there's a very big interest in Detroit and also at our university in food security, local food uh, security and food sovereignty. There's a movement like that here in Detroit. There's an urban garden movement. So, uh, uh, you know, because the population of Detroit has gone down from 2 million to 600,000. And so there's a movement to take this vacant land and turn it into either individual or community gardens. And there's many community gardens. And there is very much this idea of, of the intergenerational knowledge of how to grow food, that this knowledge should not be forgotten in our industrial time. And there's even an interest in reviving this knowledge about food. And there's a concern that what supermarkets have been selling, very processed, not necessarily healthy food, should be replaced with homegrown food and wide varieties of vegetables. So all of these topics you're mentioning are very much of interest to people here in Detroit and I was just wondering, since you interviewed so many women and you have an interest in narrative, maybe you could share with us some of the narratives of women you met and interviewed in the yes. hopes that we here in Detroit could learn something from their example. Yes. Uh... When I was preparing for this presentation, uh, I went into my daughter's room, which I've turned into a book room since she got married. <laughs> and I dug out, I dug out a 1995 report by a group of Christians who are addressing causes of hunger causes of hunger. And one of the causes of hunger I found in this report is gender discrimination. Gender discrimination. You can see that. Yeah. So I'm looking at it. I was reviewing it just as I was preparing for this presentation. Now, yes, I am so, so happy to learn that you have uh, I, I'm very happy that you have a movement which is almost similar to to what I'm trying to get into <laughs> so, so I could I could as well join your movement <laughs> from from this side <laughs> yes but the women some of the women I interviewed, I don't know whether that's visible, that photograph? Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Yes, so that was the main group I worked with. They are members of a small 
Christian community. And that's why at the very beginning of this presentation, I told you about Father Kirwen, Father Healy, who wrote the fifth gospel and who tried to develop the so-called small Christian communities in East Africa. In Brazil and South America, they talk, to, they talk about basic Christian communities, basic communities. Not in Kenya or East Africa, we say small. Small and basic, they mean the same. And this is a theological approach used by predominantly Catholic systems. And I think to some extent tied to liberation theology. Uh, more in the Catholic cultures than in the so-called Protestant cultures. But the, the, the heavy influence of uh, Catholic scholars some of them ex-seminarians in East Africa, I think has sensitized people like me who had a totally different background, but I'm not Catholic, but the Catholics call me a friend of the Catholics because I believe in a lot of what Catholics believe in. I took my children to Catholic schools, I did. And uh, they're happy. My son went to St. Mary's School in Nairobi. My daughter went to Loreto Convent School in Nairobi. And they're happy that I took them to those schools. I started off as an Adventist because I had no choice. By age 10, I couldn't make decisions on my, on my behalf. So my parents took me to a local Adventist church and they baptized me and they gave me the name Jeremiah. So I'm Humphrey Jeremiah Ojuan. When I went to high school, it was a government school. There was no religious affiliation, made a high school for four years. It was a school established by Tom Boyer, the great man. And it was a purely government school. There was no religious affiliation. So that was the liberating bit of my education because I was now free to think as myself. But when I went to Maseno school for my A-levels, I got influenced by the Anglicans, especially Bishop Henry Okunu. I have completed writing his little biography, which I will make available to my friend, Gail Presby. And I believe John Oku will be interested. Now, his, although he was Catholic, although he was Anglican, he had a, a, ben, a, a, a theological orientation towards the, theology of liberation, theology of liberation. So liberation should empower, liber, uh, sorry, theology should empower, theology should liberate. And I also draw from Paulo Freire, South America, Brazil, pedagogy of the oppressed, and the Catholic Church in East Africa has availed material from Paulo Freire and the post frerian thinkers. Pedagogy of the oppressed, pedagogy of hope, and pedagogy of liberation. So to me, I think knowledge can be enslaving, but it can also be liberating. Now, these women, their voices are important. So they, their voices should not be muted. They should be allowed to shout at the top of their lungs so that the whole world can listen to their life stories and the oral testimonies. So your question was, women, some of the stories. I will give you an example of a woman her name is, by the way, in this research, because it's life history based, I had to ask them for permission to allow me to attribute their stories to themselves. Because if I am writing the life story of Professor Gail Presby, 
Why should I anonymize her? It is her life story. It is her knowledge. So some people were asking me, why have you given their names? And I said, but it is their stories. If you're writing about Booker T. Washington, why should you anonymize him? If you're writing about Martin Luther King Jr. or the new vice president, Kamala, Kamala, I'm forgetting her the name. Harris. Harris. Sorry? Harris. Sorry? Yes. So Kamala, she's Indian. She's Caribbean. She's America. And her life story or her life history. So my work is historical to some extent, but I'm dealing with individual histories. <laughs> And in anthropology, that's one of the ways of collecting information from individual histories, individual life stories, or if you like, individual life histories. And uh, the two are used interchangeably. This, you can use life story. I think life story, you can make it more interesting, but life history is more factual. If I were to write about Odera Roka today and his late wife, Phoebe and his first wife, Millicent, I would have to men mention them by name. So you, so uh, ethnographic research, biographic research are historical. And I get my inspiration again from Cohen and Atieno Diam, their work in CIA. CIA the historical anthropology of an African landscape. And he identifies historical figures. He identifies historical figures with their names. Of course, with their permission, because he's writing about real people. So this kind of research is, is historically accurate. So there is this lady who uses Nyatiti, and she has broken the glass ceiling. She's playing the Nyatiti. Nyatiti is supposed to be uh, the liar, the Luo liar, liar, uh, Nyatiti. It is a male, it's supposed to be a male musical instrument. It is, it used to be taboo for women to play it. But this lady has broken the glass ceiling and she said, I'm going to learn how to play this instrument. I'm not going to play the piano. She knows the piano. So she uses African narrative songs as a genre to pass on information from one generation to the next, very much like the West, West African griots. So she, she talks about ethnomusicology, the use of ethnomusicology in agricultural education and extension. I covered her and her story, and uh, from her, I discovered that there are very many different songs. I'm sure my brother John can identify with some of these songs. In Luo society, whether they're in Uganda, in Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, songs, especially narrative songs, are used, have pedagogical value. They are used to teach or to educate the people formally, non-formally or informally. So from this lady, uh, her name is Atie Nosana. So Atie Nosana, you, she uses Tumnya Titi, this is a low musical instrument with eight strings. It has a hole on one side, which amplifies the sound. It is used for cultural pedagogy. Cultural pedagogy. When narrative songs 
are used to transmit important messages. It has been a male preserve, but women musicians have started playing it as an instrument of choice. And so you can see the image of the instrument, Nyatiti. I'm not sure whether John is able to see it, John? Yes, yeah. And of course, for you, even if you don't see it, you can imagine know. it. Yeah. Yes. But Gail, are oh, you yes. able to see? Oh, yes. yes. So that is the instrument which is using in cultural pedagogy. And so there are different songs. You can compose different songs. That's what she told me. And sing them in different contexts. So there are songs of, for fishing because the Luo people are known for fishing. Songs for fishing, songs for churning milk. When the girls are churning milk, they sing as they churn the milk. And they are saying, if you don't sing for the milk, then the milk will not churn. The ghee, you know, the fat <laughs> will not will not be removed. Now, I don't know how to translate this. John, you have, you have to help me now. <laughs> Singing for milk as you churn it. Mondoko olodi chak olodi chak molote nango lokne gil presby. Tip will chak, the niri pui chak e chong, a little gui wail. Adeka nane chak lodi, you know, that kind of song. Uh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> now yeah. they believe they believe if you sing, then the 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 the, the, the fat will come out faster. You know, it's a belief. So they compose songs for the milk. And it's not just the Luo people only, the Maasai people, the Samburu people. So that's a whole area of knowledge, but it is tied to food among the pastoralist people as they process dairy products traditionally, indigenous knowledge systems. So I don't know whether that makes sense from your background in Nyanza. Oh, yeah, 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 they, they do that, yeah. Um... yeah. While uh, you know, churning that milk, yeah, so they sing, yeah. yeah. So I've seen that, yeah, and uh, that belief is there, yes, in Nyanza, Luo Nyanza, South Nyanza. Yeah. Yes, and Tanzania, no, no, uh, North America. So, and then songs for pounding grain, as they pound the grain, mortar, uh -huh. uh, you know, pine, they sing. Songs for winnowing, as they winnow. Songs for grinding, you know, as, they, as they're grinding on the grinding stove. The women sing, they have special songs. Then men, songs for herding livestock. They even give their cows names, human names. I wouldn't be surprised if some bulls are called Trump in Luanyanza today, Trump mm -hmm. or Obama. Yeah, there yeah. are some used to be called Saddam and so on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, villages. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> yes, some used to be called Saddam Hussein. Saddam, yeah, in my village. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, and then they create songs for them, songs for having livestock, songs for milking. And the, my, my anthropology students tell me, the Maasai's and the Samburu, they tell me that as, they, as the milk is getting thinner and drier, they compose a song and start singing. And then they, there's more milk, you know? So they sing for the cow. They touch the cow in a fond manner. And then, the milk, then that induces more milk yield or production. Okay, very interesting. 
songs for livestock, milking animals, songs for hunting. Those hunters and gatherers, they have songs for hunting. Then songs for comforting a baby, lullabies. Songs for comforting a baby. You want to make the baby to, to go to sleep. Adika nane omiya chaklodi undiek charme mendote owite oko minkawe. You see? And yeah. you rock the baby. Then the yeah. baby goes to sleep. So that's a lullaby. And the Kenyan national anthem is actually a pokomo lullaby. The tune is a pokomo lullaby. But the lyrics to the song were given by musicologists like Athakemoli, Hislop, Omondi, Washington Omondi. Some of them are still alive. Washington Omondi is still alive. But the tune, the tune is different from the African liberation song, which is used in the frontline states in South Africa. South Africa has two national anthems, the old one and the, the African song. Now, that song was composed by a school teacher and adopted by the African National Congress, and it became the African Liberation Song. And then it was adopted, I think, by Tanzania and Zambia. I'm not so sure about Zimbabwe. I think they probably use the same uh, in the so-called frontline states. Kenya did not adopt it. Kenya adopted a lullaby from Pokomo. Uh, but now in East Africa, we have our individual national anthems. By the way, that song is God Bless Africa. So you can get the lyrics to that song. You can do your online search later on. In Isizulu and in Swahili, it's there. And uh, they kept singing it as they were mourning the death of John Pombe Magufuli. But there is also the, the new tune of the East African community. And the East African community now includes South Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Kenya. So we are six countries. But the original East African countries were Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. But now we are six. And we have a national, not a national, an East African anthem. I am yet to capture <laughs> the words, but I like, I like the tune. So lullabies. Now, then the, the songs for plowing with oxen. And I did plow with oxen when I was young. I lived on a farm. And we would sing and talk to the cows and we had our whips and we said, go and you sing and you praise the, them and they will not get tired. Around nine o'clock when the sun is getting hot, 10 o'clock and you want to finish plowing the remaining small portion, you compose songs and you sing and you, you push them to to do more work so that you complete that portion on that day. I had that personal experience myself on the farm. Okay, weeding. When people are weeding, women especially, weeding is left for children and women, they sing. When they're harvesting, marubu, tandarubu, marubu, tandarubu. You know, that's common to luya, luo, and then, songs of gathering vegetables when a woman is gathering harvesting vegetables from her vegetable garden in detroit i hope that my friend professor gail presby will learn a few songs when she's harvesting vegetables from her kitchen garden and sing for the plants you know 
because plants, when you sing for the vegetables, they, they become healthier. My sister tells me that when you talk to the plants, the house plants, and the, as you water them and you treat them tenderly, they thrive, they blossom more than when you handle them roughly. I don't know how true that is or whether it is just a belief. I don't know whether it has something to do with ecofeminism. <laughs> I am yet to learn about things like ecofeminism. <laughs> so this lady uh, composes songs and uses a previously male instrument. But she has broken the, uh, the what we, we call the glass ceiling. And now she's accepted and she is invited to meetings attended by Professor Nyang Nyongo, the Right Honorable Raila Odinga. She has performed to all these big politicians at forums in Kisumu County. So I had the opportunity to interview her. That is a very good example of one of the women, but she's educated. She has a secondary, I think she went up to Form 4 and she has attended some short courses especially in music. Now, I also got, I also got a uh, story, stories from, uh, let me just see, let me just see. Uh, yeah, I got stories from women who never stepped inside a modern classroom. They're just like the women we interviewed with Gail Presby and Vincent Okungu in the 1990s. Some of them who never stepped inside a school compound, leave alone a classroom. But they had knowledge. We discovered that they had one, knowledge, Two, skills, skills, and three, experiences. So knowledge, skills, and experiences relating to food security, food safety, food processing, food sovereignty, food sustainability. So they had the knowledge which helped them to survive based on food, food production. So one of them, was Chris, Christabel Opio Umolo. She's a sage. She's alive today. She was, at that time, she was 85 years old when I interviewed her. She must be 87 and 88. So I asked her stepson whether, how she's doing during this COVID. And I was told that she's now losing it. She's losing memory. Yeah. But when I met her, she was very candid at eight. 85. So she told me stories ab about herself. I'll give you excerpts. I'll give you excerpts. And the stories are written in first person singular. That's the methodology I adopted. It is not biographical. It is autobiographical. So it is, it is projecting their voice. The story is her story. It's not my story. I am simply a midwife. Call me a midwife. Okay? It's like Odera Oruka interviewing Oginga Odinga or some of those other sages. So that's the model I adopted. My name is Christopher Lopio. I come from Kwabwai in a place called Ratanga. I am from the clan of Orwa Ojode and Otieno Oginga. I am 85 years old. When I was a young girl, my friends gave me a nickname. They called me Opio Sachunga. Praise names were given to people during ceremonies. Sachunga was my praise name. Other praise names included Achupa, Asande, Atiga, Atai, and many more. They were names used by girls 
when they were boasting and dancing during village gatherings. My early childhood was spent in Kwabwai. When I came of age, I was married off to a man from Kanyach Kachar clan in Kanyada near Rodikopany Township. He was already married to another wife. In Lua society, the first wife is called Mikai. The second wife is called Nyachira. The third wife is called Reru. Our husband was called Philip Omolo Nyadbo. After a while, he married a third wife. So there was Mikai, who was referred to as Minaluma. There was Nyachira, who was myself. I am also called Minotisi. And there was Reru, who was called Minlando. In Lu society, married women are called by their children's names. Mother of Aluma, mother of Otisi, and mother of Lando. That is how we were identified in this large homestead of ours at Kanyachkachar in Kanyada. I do not wish to lie to you people. I never went to school. I did not even go to adult literacy classes when they were introduced by the government. All I know is poor. John Ouko, can you translate that to our sister, Gail Presby? Yeah, farming. Poor. Yeah, farming, correct. Or cultivation, yes. All I know is cultivation. Cultivation. All I know is poor. Bracket cultivation of, cultivation of garden. And ohala, what is ohala, John? That's business. Yes, trade. Yeah. So I know how to cultivate and to do business. Now look at this life. I'm commenting now. There is food production, but they sell excess. They sell excess food. So they are both farmers and traders. But I, I looked more at their farming aspect. But ideally, they are farmer, women farmers and traders because they are involved in SME. They sell in the local market. They are market women as well. They are farmers and they are market women. In West Africa, you heard of the power and the might of market women from their literature. So, uh, uh, ohala or local, buying and selling, trading or small businesses. When I was still strong, I used to plant different crops. Maize, millet, groundnuts, vegetables, and more. I still plant maize, bananas, beans, cowpeas, and other local vegetable, vegetables like osuga, akeo, mito, among others. Of course, I have a glossary in this work. I have a dictionary. In fact, I'm going to do a very good <laughs> Luo English agro ecological dictionary from my glossary because I, I learned a lot from, and you remember I talked about language and biodiversity, language and uh, ecology. And uh, so the kind of work Kokwara did. So I'll have my Lua words and the English equivalents and the scientific or botanic terms used. So I should have a little, from this work, I should have a little dictionary, and which I got from the field. So Osuga, Akeo, and Mito. Cultivation of the land is all I know. I hardly do anything else. Sometimes I treat sick women. She's also a herbalist. She uses herbalism, herbal medicine. And uh, Professor Gail Presby, interviewed some herbal pra medical practitioners in Kamagambo in the 90s. So I think this rings a bell as far as sages, women sages are concerned. Sometimes I treat sick women with indigenous medicinal plants like obalandagwa, obalandagwa, 
Professor Uko, what is Ovalandagua? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Custa custard, custard. Okay. <laughs> custard. Ovalandagua. Some of our plants have med medicinal value and we should keep them. Now she's telling me her story, what she thinks. Mind you, this lady never studied botany. She never st studied medicine. She ne never studied pharmacology or pharmacognosy. <laughs> Some of our plants have medicinal value and we should keep them. It is not bad to go to hospitals, but we should also know Yedenyaluo. Yedenyaluo. Translate that, John. Yeah, yes, traditional medicines. Yes, Yedenyaluo, traditional medicine, but yeah. much more accurately, indigenous. Okay. Indigenous medicine, indigenous. Because this, uh, I normally make a small, a slight distinction between indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge. Mm -hmm. You see, we can, in the global setting, we can take crops from India and make them our staple and make them out, make it our tradition and custom to use the crops as our own. Mm -hmm. But the source is foreign or exotic. Yeah, yeah. But indigenous means it is from here, earth grown from here. So maize is not indigenous. But when you go to a lawyer home, they'll tell you, you must eat ugali. And then they bring white maize and from seedless maize. So I asked them, is this true? You're saying, it, you're saying it is your culture. First of all, the maize you use is seedless. Mm -hmm. It has been interfered with. The genet genetically interfered with. They give you oranges which are seedless. And even the grasses, which our cows feed on. So these days they give you seeds from Simlo. Simlo is a government parastatal organization dealing in seeds. So they tell you this grass will increase milk yield. So our indigenous knowledge is erased. That's why I emphasize the word indigenous rather than traditional. So Nyaluo is not traditional. Nyaluo is indigenous. I make that fine distinction. Yedenyalu, indigenous knowledge. Indigenous to our soil. Indigenous to our soil. Of course, we can import seeds which will thrive on our soil, but they are not indigenous. And that's why in Canada, there was a time I wanted to go and visit the Dene people, but IDRC was only able to sponsor me to Tanzania and do a bit of survey. And then the, the funds did not enable me to visit the Dene people. I wanted to see how the Canadian government is bringing back the indigenous knowledge and rehabilitating this kind of knowledge. I think it's also happening in the United States of America to a lesser degree. And in New Zealand and in Australia, all these so-called new lands they're trying to go back and find and reclaim the indigenous knowledge systems. So, uh, so Yedinia Luo, that's indigenous Luo medicine, plant, especially plant-based medicine. I used to sell mogo, mogo, or maize flour. I also used to sell njugu, groundnuts. I also tried popcorn. Now look, here is a lady who didn't go to school, but she's also dealing with modern foods, popcorn, popcorn, and groundnuts, peanuts. And some of these were brought during the colonial period by the Indian nations and the, 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 the British settlerist agricultural systems. So when you take the theme of food security as an ethnographic 
area of inquiry, you are actually studying the entire society. By merely talking about food, live alone health, just food and nutrition. Look at the openings and, the, and you ask them, what, tell me what you used to eat. Tell me what you used to plant. Tell me what you used to sell. Yeah. So I also tried popcorn when it was introduced in our locality. I traveled far and wide as a woman trader. Uh, then translation into Jalok Ohala. I went as far as Kibera and Madari in Nairobi. She was from Homer Bay, but she would take the bus OTC. And that's the time when her son was born, a firstborn son. So she used to be called Min OTC. Now o OTC, Overseas Trading Company. The buses were very famous, be plying between Homa Bay and Nairobi, Kisumu and Nairobi, Migori and Nairobi. So when she gave birth to her firstborn son and she was a trader, the villagers, because she was always gone, with her grain selling, one day coming back home, then gone again. So she was a trader and a farmer. So her son, who is still alive, is called OTC. So she is the, the mother of OTC. <laughs> but the Lua just say OTC. Now look at, look at the network, the food chain, and the role of this single woman in the, in the food system, locally and nationally because she was connected with Homa Bay and Nairobi, Kibera and Madari, the slums, where the low speaking people who are workers in industrial area lived. Look at the interconnectivity. It's powerful, isn't it? But you started from food. Then the story takes you to different parts, geographical parts of Kenya and East Africa for that matter. I was an energetic trader always on the road. <laughs> Translate that, John Uko. <laughs> you know, I trade, uh, uh, deliver things to different places and come back, I don't know. But I trade between different places, back and forth. So she was always on the road. Right. <laughs> yes. With her maize, with her groundnuts, with her, you know, and she would deliver, then take the next bus yeah. overnight mm. to Homer Bay, then get more back to the night bus, Nairobi. You see, and that happens even with younger women today, Wakulima Market. You know Wakulima Market in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. They do the same. And Kangemi. Yeah. So, but I wasn't interested in an urban area. I was more interested in the rural women. But they they still had urban connections. So that, as you can tell from the story, our husband was a good man. Notice that she's not saying my husband, and that's where Barack Obama is sincere, but he's sincerely wrong. My good friend Barack Hussein Obama, former president. United States of America is sincere, but he's sincerely wrong because he wrote, he wrote a very good book, but he gave it a wrong title. Dreams from my father. How can he be my father? So he, he has often individualized fatherhood and his father had three, at least three wives, at least three wives, two white American women, I think one of, of, of Jewish origin, and another one of European origin, his mother, the anthropologist, okay? Mm -hmm. And in Kenya, the man left a wife from my mother's clan, Karachuanya. She's still alive. A woman's mother and my mother come from the same place. Okay? And then after the Jewish wife 
left and remarried a Tanzanian Maasai, this is all in the public domain. This is all part of biographical and autobiographical material. So he married yet another woman, a Luo woman. And the son has also written his side of the story of Senior Obama. And here comes President Barack H. Obama. No, he was still a senator. So he writes a book, Dreams from My Father. Why not dreams from our father? So I, I asked somebody, does Obama know the Lord's Prayer? And if he does, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And he said, when, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven. Don't pray, my Father who is in heaven. Because you are not alone on this planet. You are praying for yourself and your siblings and your community, and your parents, and your friends. <laughs> so, our father. So that's why I normally critique Obama. I say, just from the title itself, dreams from my father. Of course, he's trying to look at his father from his own perspective. But here is a woman who does not talk about my husband. She talks about our husband. Our husband was a good man. Not my husband was a good one. Because there were three. I gave birth to 12 children. You know, most of them are dead. I am left with one son called OTC. I think mortality was very high. And the two married daughters. I have several grandchildren and great-grandchildren. During holidays, they come and help me with tasks like doyle charm, weeding, and harvesting. The Luo people practice agriculture. She's still talking about her experience of food and agriculture. Agriculture, livestock, keeping, and fishing for their daily sustenance. There are different activities in agriculture. Then she talks about Golopur, and she gives the traditions regarding Golopur, that's land preparation. I will not read the details in Luo, but I have the translations. Golokodi, planting season. Doyo cham, weeding season. Kayo cham, harvesting season. And Kano cham, storage of the, the harvest. And then she continues to explain about vegetables which were constantly in the yard, in the compound. A compound had to have what they called orundu, orundu or kirundu. And she says, So the activities of women farmers concerning vegetables. So vegetables, growing of vegetables, that was the preserve of women. It's, it's an extension of your kitchen. That's what she explained that to be, to me. And then she explains how food must be found in a homestead. Not, notice this is a polygamous homestead with three households, three households, but one homestead. And each, homestead, each household is headed by a woman. That's what I realized. The women were totally in charge of the, the women were totally in charge of, uh, the, the, the women were totally in charge of uh, the food security in her house. Mikai, Nyachira, and Reo. So because time is long gone, I want to conclude by saying that this one story, I, had, I have 36 of them, but I've just used one for textual demonstration purposes and also to show you, to give you a feel of what I'm getting into because I don't consider myself to have finished. I have just started a new life. And I want to go into agroecology, 
philosophy, humanity, and agro agroecology, agroecology. But my emphasis will be femininity, the role of femininity more than masculinity because of my gender, interest in gender studies. And my good friend, Gail, you are free to join me. You remember you helped me to teach the pioneer group. I have mentioned it here. You are appreciated. Let me read for you how I have acknowledged you. Just that, then I'll conclude. Acknowledgements. Uh, uh, mm. Good, I found it. I wish. Okay, I am indebted to Africanists such as Professor Bertwell Awanogot, Professor Lucia Ndonga Omondi, and Professor Duncan Okoto Kombo, whose works in low history, language, and ecology have inspired my ethnographic fieldwork. Reading Professor Omondi's work on the role of language in agriculture and rural development triggered off my interest in low indigenous knowledge for food security, I wish to thank Dr. Joseph H. Muleka of the Department of Literature, University of Nairobi for the intellectual insights and support he gave me during the preparation of this work. I'm also indebted to my old literature teacher and mentor, Mwalimu Austin Luanga Bukenya, who continues to inspire me from his Gayaza hideout in Uganda. His folkloric ideas on oracha and literary works helped me in developing my approaches to African narrative pedagogy and African feminist epistemology. Okay. So interesting, but now the time is drawing short. We appreciate any concluding remarks you have. Yes, I am finishing by thanking you. And now, now, I am also intellectually indebted to my former colleagues, Dr. Sky Hughes from Canada and Professor Gail Presby from America, who introduced me to the sociological and philosophical aspects of women and gender studies during their stints at the University of Nairobi. Professor Gail Presby actually teamed up with me and co-taught my pioneer postgraduate class of communication and gender studies. I am greatly indebted to all my students of education, literature, linguistics, anthropology, and gender studies at the University of Nairobi who have, ex who have enthusiastically exchanged great ideas with me for over three decades. And in Luo culture, when you complete a narrative, you say, Futinda, Adonga, Donga, Rom, Gimera, Senior Chief, Sepania, Malit, Maruud Karachuan. Futinda, John will translate that for girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't have a direct English equivalent. <laughs> uh, but you can try to explain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, that, 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 that's it. And um, uh, it was great. And uh, he hopes to... To live long and have to do more and more and more. And grow as tall as my maternal uncle, the senior chief of the yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the whole project was narratological. Thank you. Back to you, <laughs> Professor Gail Presby. We want to thank you so much for sharing the story of your your own intellectual journey and your own encounters with these women and then sharing for us stories, the firsthand stories of their lives 
in their struggles as we learn so much about language and song and all the different aspects of food that need attention, food security, food sovereignty, and, and all the songs that accompany growing, harvesting of food, and then the networks of trading in food. We've learned so much from these women, and I'm sure when we get your entire study, we can learn even more, but we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us and the larger Detroit community what you've known so far. And so I want to thank you and also to thank John and the philosophy department thanks you and also our women and gender studies program thanks you because they're also co-sponsors of this event. And we look forward to future uh, collaborations. So I want to wish you well and wish you and, pe and people in Kenya health during these challenging times, during these pandemics. And thank you very much. And John, if you have any concluding words, you can also add them. Oh yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Humphrey, Joan. This was wonderful. You know, you are building indigenous knowledge and uh, there is a lot to be learned here. And uh, we hope to collaborate in the future to, you know, I like this um, bottom up approach, you know, devolution of knowledge, and, you know, uh, going back to the indigenous roots, uh, right? So, uh, uh, this is uh, wonderful, and thank you very much. So, uh, so we have a question and comment from Olivia. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us today and share your thoughts and stories. I was just wondering if the writing and sharing of these women's stories has added value because these women may not have the opportunity to share their stories due to issues such as gender differences in access to education. Okay, and that's, that's a very good point. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything about that, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, women usually uh, are more powerless in comparison to men. And so um, men are usually, uh, you know, considered to be the ones, like especially the elders, like to be knowledgeable in the traditional system. And I think a chance to hear the voice of the women is, you know, very good and it's quite empowering. But they also have, you know, knowledge that is that indigenous knowledge, like the women sages who are interviewed, uh, that are good, that can help the community as we move into the future. For example, the knowledge of seeds, uh, they are like the seed banks, we are told that, and that is uh, very, very important, that knowledge of seeds, you know, uh, because now, um, because of the changes that are coming with modernity, you know, even how to farm, how to grow crops, and now we have like monoculture, um, and the, which is not good if crop failure can be devastating. Just, uh, but instead, uh, with the indigenous uh, system and knowledge, there's mixed cropping. In one small garden or small farm, you find varieties like eight. You know, that's uh, eight different uh, types of plants, indigenous, and that is very good uh, for food security. It's also very good for the soil. I need to, and you know that mono. Uh, monoculture actually um, really you know, destroys the soil over time. And so I think um, uh, uh, that knowledge like of seeds um, is very important. And, you know, um, so that's what I can add there. The, in, in, in brief, um, it's a chance uh for their voices to be heard but also the knowledge is very important 
Thank you for that, John. And I wanted to add, because you probably heard uh, Dr. Ojuang say that he interviewed some women who have never been to school. Uh, it may be that some of the people he interviewed were quite elderly, because yeah. more and more the young children are going to school. But it's important to capture the ideas of the elderly while they are still here with us and before they pass, and to uh, preserve those ideas for the next generations. And sometimes their knowledge has been ignored, marginalized, because there's a focus on, um, in the university, there's a focus on uh, the sciences, or there's a focus on people with degrees saying something. And so the valuable knowledge they may have may have gone unrecorded. And so part of what a project like Dr. Ojuang's project does is go into the rural areas and be able to find the women where they are and record that knowledge, transcribe it, include it in writing for a larger audience, not only an audience abroad, but also very importantly, an audience within Kenya so that they stay uh, they stay uh, connected to the, to the uh, knowledge of their an ancestors. And that's why when he mentioned uh, the Dine in Canada, it's the same kind of thing. You don't want the eldest persons of a community to pass without having a record of this. Yes, they want to pass it to their family members, orally, but it's also good to get a recording of it. And all of these songs is also part of the record. And so once again, thank you so much for attending. Uh, this is it for class events this semester, but I know uh, many of you still have a few weeks of challenging academic work ahead of you, and so I want to wish you all a very good uh, last weeks of your semester, and for any members of the general public who are here with us, thank you so much for joining us, and please realize we are always happy to have you here at our class events. You can always go to the class website and check at our upcoming events or even links to videos of our past events. And so uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ba Baxter, for bringing your students. Thank you also to uh, Professor Ojuang for all your time in talking to us and please have a good evening. I'll end the meeting now, but so wonderful to be here with you, so.